So I'm going to read a short dream, and we'll see where we go from, from there. But this was a fascinating dream sent to me several months ago. Most of the dreams given to me lately are very detailed, somewhat lengthy. It seems like uh, the dreamers have gone to another level. But um, this was a, a short dream. It was like, to me, just the Lord wanted to get my attention. And he wanted to prompt me to look for some things in Scripture. So the dream says, you and a couple of other fellows, I won't give their names, not that it matters. We're, we're gathered, we were gathered in one place to hold a meeting. Before the meeting started, they told me it was time to feed the river. It's time to feed the river. I'd never heard that phrase before. I really didn't understand it. It wasn't get in the river. It wasn't drink from the river. It wasn't cross the river. It wasn't swim in the river. It was feed the river. So the three of us were walking along the river and Cece was with me. She and I walked off and sat to it by ourselves and sat down and on the river bank. We we're just enjoying the scenery. And they came to me again and said, it's time for you to feed the river. They brought me some buckets. Never told, I'm never told here what was in the bucket. But they brought me buckets. And I stepped into the river and began walking through the river and every once in a while dropping a bucket. I did this until all the buckets were gone. Along the walk, I passed areas where camps were set up and people were fishing. And when I walked by them, they would shout, Thank you. Thank you for feeding the river. Now we're going to catch some big ones. I walked back to the other guys and they said, now we can start the meeting. So I said, Lord, what is this about? And the only thing I knew to do was to begin to search for places in Scripture where someone threw something in the river. And I looked up several places. But the one that really grabbed me was in Second Kings 3. Where immediately after Elisha received the mantle of Elijah. Just after he crossed the river. Said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the Jordan parted. He came to Jericho. And it's fascinating to me that this, the, the, the prophets, there were three places where they had schools of, prof, of the prophets. And this was one of them. Why, why would you, why would you choose a place to raise up a school of the prophets that was under a curse of death. Because after Jericho was overthrown in the book of Joshua, Joshua cursed it. He said, nobody's ever going to rebuild this place without death. And that curse was working because when Elisha arrived there, they came to him and they said, this place is beautiful, but there's death in the water. And it causes barrenness 
throughout this entire land. Isn't that a fascinating word? If you study the word there, that's what it means. One definition, lexicon gave me the word abortion. And they said, this place is beautiful, but the water is so defiled. Well, it was cursed. And the curse said that when Joshua said it, this will be forever. So Elisha, this, now this is what I thought Elisha should do. He should have sat down these young prophets and he should have said, this is what you get for being so stupid is to build the school of the prophets here where this place is curse is. Now you need to move it. It's always going to be cursed. But he didn't. He said, bring me a new jar and put salt in it. I can only assume, because as I search the scriptures, you can find the salt covenant, you can find salt used at other times, but the most striking passage I could find that related to this was Jesus saying, we, as his new vessels, are the salt. You are the salt of the earth, he said. So Elisha pours it in. He fed the river with salt, picturing us, and the water was healed and never again caused miscarrying and barrenness and death. I think what struck me as the most significant, obviously this is a picture of Jesus who can deliver us from the curse of death. But what struck me as so significant was that even though a man that God honored had said, probably at the leading of Holy Spirit, I'm going to curse this place and nobody's going to be able to, 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 to get out from under it. It's going to be forever. When God was given an opportunity to lift that curse and heal the land, mercy triumphed over judgment. Because, he, you know, he always gave, he, he, he made it very clear in Scripture, when I pronounce a judgment, I'm always claiming the right that if they repent, if they turn from their sin, I'll relent. Because my heart is not to judge and destroy. My heart is always to redeem. I take great pleasure in mercy, not judgment. So what the Lord began to speak to me, this is why I'm launching from this point. He said, I want you to tell my people to stop cursing their cities. And begin pouring salt, feeding the river with who they are speak blessing and healing and transformation over cities that you even think are cursed that God could never do anything in that place they are so far out there they are so weird in this and that and so rebellious to God he could never do anything there well I have news for you he's going to come to some of these places and he's going to pour the salt in and heal the water and break the curse And we're going to catch some big fish there. <laughs> you know, I toy with the idea once in a while of doing a cursed cities tour. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
You're thinking the same thing. I shouldn't have said it because it's lodged now in his prophetic mind. He probably prophesied into that before we finish. I just think we we just don't quite believe he could do for places today what he did for Nineveh. What was at the time the number one, probably the number one religious stronghold in the world, Jerusalem, became the headquarters of redemption. He can do this. He needs us to pour blessing in, not curses. Feed the river with life-giving words.